This is AutoLine Daily with the latest news in the global automotive industry. That 40-day long UAW strike against General Motors really hurt both the union and the company. GM lost over 51,000 sales during the strike and lost a tenth of a point of market share. And while it ran its plants on maximum overtime and offered sales incentives to try and get those sales back, it came up short. Moreover, there are still parts shortages caused by the strike, which is infuriating customers who can't get their cars repaired. They may not want to ever come back and buy a GM car again. You know, one of the main bargaining issues for the UAW is job security. But you don't get job security when you drive up to 51,000 customers away. Chevy is revealing more information about the new Trailblazer, which it first confirmed for the U.S. market back in May of last year. Under the hood are two engine options, a 1.2-liter turbo and a 1.3-liter turbo, which produces 155 horsepower. A CVT is standard, but a 9-speed automatic is also available on 1.3-liter models with all-wheel drive. There will be two trim levels to choose from, RS and Active. RS has a sportier appearance, while Active has a more off-road look with unique tires and unique shock tuning. You know, we don't always report on trim levels, but we find the Trailblazer's Active trim interesting because Ford already offers Active versions of its passenger cars in Europe that are also meant to be more rugged in appearance. The only real difference is Chevy spells ITS in all caps and without an E at the end. We wonder if the two companies have some sort of agreement or if we could see some sort of lawsuit. Maybe we'll find out closer to when the Trailblazer, which starts at under 20 grand before destination charges, goes on sale in the spring of this year. The shift to electric vehicles is underway, and Kia just laid out its EV goals over the mid to long term. Called Plan S, by the end of 2025, the company will offer 11 battery electric vehicles and is aiming to hit 6.6% of the global EV market, excluding China. And by 2025, it's targeting 500,000 pure EV sales annually and 1 million global sales of eco-friendly vehicles, also excluding China. On top of that, the plan includes expanding mobility services for electric and autonomous vehicles and entering the purpose-built vehicle market. It's an ambitious plan, which is why the company will spend $25 billion by the end of 2025 to help achieve its goals. What a difference one SUV makes. Lamborghini sold 8,205 vehicles last year, up a whopping 43% from the year before, and double the number from 2017. Nearly 5,000 of those 8,000 vehicles were the Urus, Lambo's first SUV. This has got to worry Ferrari. Lamborghini is closing in fast and is only about 1,000 units behind in total sales. And it's all thanks to the Urus. Ferrari's SUV? The Porto Sangue is over two years away and is more of a shooting break than a real SUV. And so we wonder, could Lamborghini catch Ferrari in sales? There was a time when we would have never even thought to ask that question. And the same goes for Rolls-Royce. It sold 5,152 cars last year, up 25% from the year before, and the most cars it has ever sold in its 116-year-old history. While Rolls did not break out sales for its different models, it said the Cullinan, its first ever SUV, is what drove that increase in sales. And all of this must delight BMW, which owns Rolls-Royce. A decade ago, a LiDAR unit for an autonomous car cost about $70,000. But at CES, Velodyne, unveiled a LiDAR unit that only costs $100. Called the Velobit, it's smaller than a deck of playing cards. Though it's not as capable as the spinning mechanical units, it's still quite impressive, with a range of up to 100 meters and a field of view of 60 degrees horizontal by 10 degrees vertical. Velodyne says it's perfect for level two and level three cars 
and for passenger drones. Auto Line Daily is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires. Your journey, our passion. Car sales in the U.S. last year dipped below the 17 million mark for the first time in five years. Some analysts expect that trend to continue, but thanks to more people getting their license, especially millennials, sales are expected to remain strong over the next five to 10 years. According to Benchmark Co., there were a record 227.5 million licensed drivers in the U.S. in 2018. By 2025, there will be 245 million licensed drivers, which could result in an extra 3 million car sales a year. Over the last five years, there were 15.4 million new drivers in the U.S., the biggest increase since the 1970s. And over the next five years, another 12.5 million people will get their license. Because of that, the report says the underlying demographics supports demand of 16.5 to 17 million units annually for the next five to 10 years, which would be great news for the auto industry. SUVs are all the rage, and sporty versions of them bring even bigger profits. So Audi is bringing the S versions of the Q7 and the Q8 to the U.S. They'll be powered by a 4-liter twin-turbo V8 that makes 500 horsepower, which is planted to the ground via an 8-speed automatic transmission and all-wheel drive. Both models will do 0 to 60 in 4.3 seconds. Other highlights include unique 20 or 21-inch wheels, standard all-wheel steering, and a sport differential. Pricing will be released closer to when the SQ7 and SQ8 go on sale this spring. Last year, Porsche signed a Memorandum of Understanding with Boeing to explore premium urban air travel. And someone has uncovered patents the automaker filed for its own VTOL. You can see where inspiration for the Boeing concept came from, but there are a few differences, mainly the four propellers that allow the VTOL to fly. The two at the front are stationary, while the two at the rear are able to rotate. The aircraft is fully electric and autonomous, but does allow qualified people to take over if it's needed. That's it for today. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you right back here again tomorrow.